Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am at Legacy Collectibles today because they have a very interesting uh, experimental prototype self-loading conversion of the 1903 Springfield. Now, this actually isn't so much a conversion of the 1903 Springfield as it is a self-loading rifle built using Springfield parts. And we don't know who exactly did this, we don't know exactly when, but I have a theory, and I'll touch on that theory after we take it apart and I show you how it works. However, I think one of the most relevant pieces of information here when looking at a rifle like this is to remember that in 1904 the US government uh, formally authorized Springfield Armory to sell rifles to inventors. The US government was really interested in getting private industry and individual private inventors into developing the firearm. So they were interested in, in particular, semi-automatic conversions as well as anything else that might prove useful to the US military. And so what better way to encourage inventors to work on the US military's rifle than to sell them rifles out of the arsenal, rel well, not, not necessarily cheap, but easy access. You want to do a weird conversion here, we'll sell you the rifle and maybe it'll work out, and if it doesn't, well, it's not a big expense for the US. So that is why you see so many of these sort of weird custom experimental ideas from the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, all built on Springfield 1903 rifles, because that was easily available to people. So uh, with that aside, what we have here is a 1914 dated Springfield barrel. The stock on this thing has been cut off by someone, no idea when, no idea why, to be honest, except that the thing is kind of excessively long and it's a little more convenient to move it around without the buttstock on it. And then we have a really unique self-loading mechanism. So let's take a look at that up close. We take a quick look down the length of this thing before we start tearing it apart. Uh, we have a Springfield Armory uh, 1914 barrel. This is specifically a February of 1914 barrel. Uh, the stock has been cut to fit Springfield uh, bands and hardware, but it's not actually a 1903 Springfield stock because the receiver of this gun, which is about twice as wide as my camera field of view here. Uh, the receiver is far longer than a Springfield, so, and, and there's no splice in this stock. So someone uh, custom made this stock and did a pretty nice job of it. Um, and they made the front end look just like a Springfield. So the most important part, one of, there are only a few parts of this rifle that actually came from the, the donor Springfield. The barrel bands and nose cap, uh, the barrel itself is the most important one, and then also the rear sight. So uh, what we have up here is a folding charging handle. I can pull this out and cycle the bolt with that. So that's, that's cool. It runs actually pretty smoothly, which is a little surprising for a lot of the guns like this. Um, on the back here, are, this is our charging handle guide. There's a notch here so that you can, in theory, lock the bolt open. There is a stripper clip guide up here. Uh, it is missing the floor plate currently, but this would have had a standard Springfield type Mauser type floor plate. So it would have a five round internal magazine. Remember that this is a prototype patent model sort of rifle. This is not something that would have been adopted, even best case, in, its, in this configuration. If the military liked it, they would have potentially looked at something like giving it a detachable magazine or, or making other changes. So. Uh, back here, this is the end of the charging handle guide and also the recoil spring guide. So the recoil spring is sitting in this channel along the side of the receiver. We have a rear end cap here. We have a little takedown lever that allows us to pull the rear end cap out. There's not much on this side. It originally would have had a screw uh, locking the end cap in place, but that's missing. This is a manual uh, bolt hold open, so you can open in fact, I can show you that. You can open the bolt and then press that down and it will hold the bolt in place. It's just a little, little lever right down there. Right there. So we'll go ahead and close this because the next thing we're going to do... A little sticky. The next thing we're going to do is actually take this apart and see how it works. So first step is I'm going to take off the trigger assembly, and then I'm going to take off the stock, and then we can work on the metal by itself. All right, 
both screws out. Now I can pull the whole magazine and trigger assembly out of the gun. Uh, you can see we have the original Springfield magazine assembly here, and then this receiver has been made very long to accommodate this mechanism. And back here we have a hammer-fired firing system. So it's very simple. There's a hammer spring right there. That's the hammer itself. And when it comes back, it's going to lock under that sear right there. You can see that pulls back. You can see it just barely right up there, a little hidden behind the, the side walls of the trigger. But there is a semi-auto disconnector in here as well, so it's a semi-auto only rifle. Take just a moment here and pull the handguard off, and then the stock. All right, we can take the handguard off. Uh, when investigating a rifle like this, one of the first things that can give you a really good idea of what you're looking at is simply removing the handguard allows me to see that there doesn't appear to be any sort of gas port on the barrel. We also don't see any wear back here that might indicate that the barrel moves, which would be uh, indicative of a recoil operating system. Now, because we've got the trigger guard out, I can take the stock off. There we go. This is a nicely inleted stock. As I said, there's no splice in it, so someone made this all from scratch. They've given it a couple of reinforcing pins through here. Um, and the stock, stock looks really good, other than the, the butt stock end being cut off for some reason. But looking at this cut, this is, this is an old cut. I don't know when it was done, but it wasn't all that recently. Now we can disassemble the back end of the rifle. We've got this. Now you can see what that actually does. It's just a little latch back here. So if I pull this down far enough... Oh, all right, I'm going to use... Use a plastic punch to hold that latch down. And that allows me to remove this rear end cap. They're the remains of what I think was a leather uh, buffer on the back for when the bolt hits this. Next up we're going to remove the end of the recoil spring guide. This is held in place by a lug and then just secured by a screw. So taking the screw off will not cause this to spring out, but you never know. Um, I took this apart before we started filming, so I would know what I was looking at, and I was very careful to hold on to this that first time. But now that I know it, this, pull forward, there we go. So you can see this lug here sits in that little recess. That holds it in place. We've got a guide rod and this little end cap. And then the mainspring for this thing is rather long and sits in this compartment in the side. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Now, in order to take the bolt out, I actually have to leave the charging handle in its folded position because it runs in this cylinder. So we're just going to push this back, which gets a little wonky. Push it back. There's a brass punch in there. This is our charging handle guide, and it's going to prevent the bolt from coming out of the receiver, which is a good thing. Uh, in order to manually disassemble it, what we can do is rotate that up, and then I can pull it out. And see there's our folding end of the charging handle. That releases the bolt, so I can pull it now out of the gun. That assembly is also kind of held in place by this spring catch. There we go. And there is our bolt assembly. So this is really the key element in the system. So the way this gun works mechanically is when the bolt is traveling in the receiver, both lugs are vertical like this. These lugs always stay vertical. They are actually held in place in the receiver right here and can't rotate. All right, now we have a cam pin here that's going to cause this front section the bolt itself uh, to rotate. This has a single locking lug on it, which is this big bar, which locks into this space. So the locking surface for the rifle is the rear of the ejection port opening right here. Right off the bat that's not great for a high pressure self-loading rifle, well for a high pressure rifle at all. You ideally want uh, symmetrical locking lugs. Not everything has them, granted there are a lot of tilting bolt uh, firearms, like the FAL, for example, that don't have symmetrical locking lugs. But 
if you've got a rotating bolt you can generally do it and it's a better idea. Now at the front of this thing, the bolt head actually is a separate component that can slide back and forth, and you can see the extractor can slide with it. We also have a spring-loaded firing pin in the back. You saw that this was hammer fired, so that's what the hammer hits. When this goes into battery, this is going to lock in place like that, and there's just a slight gap right here. Alright, now when this fires we have a little bit of a gap up here, and the cartridge of course is going to push back on this, and when it does, remember this whole piece, you can see the, the continuation of this piece here, the bolt face is going to push on it. So it's just a little tiny bit of movement, but if you watch right there, when I push here, that opens up. That doesn't seem like much, but it's a really hard, really fast push on that bolt face. Let's see if I can. So it's going to be more like that, and what you see there is that the initial impulse starts this moving, and it's got a lot of inertia to it because of how fast the, the pressure of firing pushes on this, and that's going to cause that cam pin to force a rotation between these two parts. Well, this back part is held rigid by the gun, so the rotation, when it happens, forces this to accelerate backwards, and the locking lug here to rotate upwards. And it's going to do that until the locking lug is vertical, then the locking lug is unlocked, and this whole assembly can travel backwards, which will extract the cartridge. Now, there's a fundamental question of how, what exactly is happening that allows the bolt face to move backwards? And as I see it, there are two possibilities. One of them is that the whole case, uh, basically the headspace of the case, is left uh, non-fixed, I suppose. So when the, when the thing fires, the whole case moves back and pushes this. That's probably most likely. The other possibility is that the case actually sticks in the front and stretches, uh, and that stretch gives it enough extra length to do that. Um, a guy named Francis K. Young, who we will talk about in a minute, developed a rifle specifically based on a stretching case as an operating system, which sounds crazy and kind of, well, kind of is crazy, but he did do that. And this is rather similar. So whether the case stretches or physically moves, I'm not sure, but I think that's how this was supposed to work. Now, we've got a lot more travel in this than is actually uh, than can actually happen when the bolt's locked into the, the rifle. Um, I would show you that, but it's, it's way up inside the gun and there's just no easy way to see it with the camera. Uh, we also have this spacer plate, which seems unnecessary, and I suspect that these elements are here because the designer was experimenting with just how much of this space was necessary to get the gun to run properly without uh, rupturing cases. And so I think he started rather long, he added a spacer and was tinkering with uh, the depth at which the chamber was cut past the locking surface. So past this, well, this datum, how deep uh, is the, the, the barrel face? So how far forward does the front of the bolt here sit? And if you were going to make this system work, that would take a lot of trial and error. And I think that's what was going on when the rifle reached its current configuration. Most likely, unfortunately, the inventor discovered that this didn't really work, and so he left it in a condition that probably isn't totally reliable, and either abandoned the idea or more likely went on to a different iteration that required starting with a new rifle. Now there's one other similar system that I think we ought to touch on here, and that's John Guerin's primer activated system, or piston primer style of gun. And that's the one that I think a lot more people are familiar with, because, well, frankly, it's the system that actually did work, although it wasn't formally adopted. The way that we can tell that this is not a primer activated gun is by the fact that the whole breech face here moves. On a primer activated gun, your head space is fixed and is proper and safe, and the cartridge case does not move. Instead, the primer acts as a little tiny piston, and the primer pushes back out of the, the case head. And so on a primer activated gun, we would expect a very small diameter piston that's, well, the same diameter as the primer, in the center of the bolt face. That piston would move, and that movement would cause something to unlock. This, because the breech face is fixed, uh, the primer can't back out of the gun because, well, it's flush with the rest of the case head. Uh, instead, the entire cartridge case, or at least the back half of it, 
has to move in order to activate this. So that's the difference fundamentally between primer activated and Franklin Young's weird ideas. All right, so there's the whole gun laid out, less the stock. Uh, definitely a really interesting piece. I love looking at these uh, early semi-auto designs. So let's talk about where this may have come from. Now I said I had a theory on who made this, and my theory is it's a guy named Francis K. Young who was patenting and developing ideas very similar to this in the early 1920s. In fact, the Institute of Military Technology has a fascinating uh, Franklin Young prototype rifle that's not quite the same mechanism as this, but pretty darn similar. And it's similar enough, and this is similar enough to some of Francis Young's patents that while I have no definitive proof that this is his, it doesn't perfectly match any of his patents, but the time frame is right, the mechanism is right. If I had to take a guess, I would go with Francis Young as the developer of this rifle. Now, it's, there, there are a bunch of reasons why this didn't eventually see any military service or adoption or commercial adoption. It's all the systems that involve moving the primer or moving the case or stretching the case in the chamber. These things are all not really great ideas, uh, far inferior to the ideas that would take over things like gas and recoil operation. And so that's why we never see this. Uh, it would be way too dependent on really good quality ammunition made to exactly the right specification. And there's a lot of potential for burst cases and other problematic uh, things should the system go wrong. So at any rate, it's really cool to get a chance to take a look at a rifle like this. There are very few and far between, and I think they're a fascinating look at the ideas of the 1920s. Before people really knew what would make a, how, how do you do a self-loading rifle in a high-pressure uh, cartridge like 30 6 Well, people experimented with all manner of different, different ideas, and this is one of them. So a big thanks to Legacy Collectibles for giving me access to film this for you guys. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of thing, or if you're interested in particularly uh, World War II historical firearms, definitely check out their YouTube channel. They have a bunch of other cool stuff you can take a look at. Thanks for watching.